Please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers. My name is Gillian Riley, and I have the honour of serving as the President of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Welcome. When developing club programming, we work hard to ensure a diversity of views as well as speakers. Ontario's Premier is a prime example. Before I formally introduce her, let me tell you about some of our upcoming events, which I hope you will consider joining us. On Monday, May 7th, popular television broadcaster Ali Velshi will speak to us about anchoring in the Trump era. And on Thursday, May 10th, Michael Colm, the city's first chief transformation officer, will discuss Toronto's proposal for the Smart Cities Challenge. To order your tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit us at our website, canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO or by using that hashtag. I do want to let you know that you've probably seen that there are no Q&A cards provided at your tables because the Premier is going to be taking questions directly from the floor, so I hope you'll think up some good questions while you're listening to her, her speech. I want to offer a special thanks to today's event sponsors, Insurance Bureau of Canada, represented by David McGowan, and Morneau Chappelle, represented by Joe Blomley. Thank you very much. I also want to acknowledge the youth and young leaders who are with us today from C.W. Jeffries Collegiate Institute, sponsored by Bell Canada. Please stand so we can acknowledge you. Over here. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And now our guest speaker. It's a good thing that the Premier of Ontario is a runner. Since she became the province's 25th Premier in 2013, she has been racing across the province to identify challenges and offer solutions. From enhanced infrastructure, retirement security, gender equality, to economic stability, the Wynne government has focused on creating opportunity for Ontarians and businesses alike. The province enjoys the distinction of being Canada's economic engine with good reason. Minimum wage is up, childcare spaces have increased, prescription drugs are free for young people, and a basic income pilot project has caught the world's attention. Her government has invested in ensuring that our roads, transportation systems, schools, and hospitals are modernized. These investments have fueled economic growth and development around the province. Premier Wynne has been an MPP for 15 years. During that time, she has served as a minister in five different government departments, including Aboriginal Affairs, Transportation, and Education. Before entering provincial politics, she was a Toronto District School Board trustee. Her passion for children's issues and education is ev evident in the province's policy priorities. With the provincial election looming, we are keen to hear what the Premier has to say. Please welcome Premier Wynne to the Canadian Club podium. Let me just start by thanking all of you for being here. It is a beautiful day. You could be out in the sunshine. First sunny day we've had in, I don't know, six months. And uh, I appreciate you coming here because it is a really, really important time in the election cycle. So thank you for making the time to be here, and I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk today about some of the choices that people are going to be confronting come June the seventh. And uh, you know, we are we are dealing with uh, a really particular context in which people will be making those choices. And so, uh, let me just talk about that context for a moment, and then I'll come back to uh, I'll come back to the the choices that I think are confronting people. So. We're dealing in Ontario, in Canada, 
I would suggest globally, with an enormous amount of change. And we're dealing with a pace of change that is unprecedented. So whether it's climate change, when we see, you know, we see the, uh, the extreme weather events happening, whether it's technology, um, this is, I'm in, a, a, in Stelco uh, in Hamilton a few weeks ago here, and you know, I was standing in a part of the plant where there were, there were 500 workers at one point, and now there are about 24 because of the change in technology, essentially. And, and so we're dealing with that kind of change, and what it means is people, you know, people may not say what's making me anxious is climate change, but when you're in an environment where that kind of uncertainty is, uh, is part of the, literally the air that you breathe, that has an impact. And so people wonder, what's work gonna look like for my kids? What, you know, what, are my, uh, what are my prospects like? How am I gonna look after my elderly parents? Those are all questions that people live with on a, on a daily basis. And so I was in Brantford the other day, a few weeks ago, when the flooding was happening. And uh, I was in one of the warming centers where people were coming because of the flooding. And a man came across the street to me, and he had heard that I was there, and he wanted to talk to me about the um, basic income pilot. Because he had lost his job because he was looking after his mom. And he had some personal issues that he was dealing with. But he had applied for the basic income pilot. He'd been accepted, and he came across the street to tell me what a difference it was making in his life, that he was able to get his car back on the road, and he was able to be part of the community again, and he, was, he felt like his life was getting back on track. And the reason I raise that is that we have to try everything. <coughs> we have to look for ways, as government, to put more security and more um, predictability into people's lives. That is, it's what's fair, but it's also what's good for communities and good for individuals. And to my mind, it's what government exists to do. You know, government exists to do the things that people can't do by themselves and to help people to address the challenges that they are, they're confronting in their lives. Because people want to be able to look after themselves. They want to be able to care for themselves and their families, but sometimes they need that support. And so that's what putting the basic income pilot in place was about, but it's also, it's also why we're doing all the things that we are doing. So one of the things that's being said right now is that by the, um, by the conservatives is that we don't want to run on our record, that I don't want to run on my record, and I don't want to be associated with my record. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I am very, very proud of our government's record. You know, I am very proud of the fact that when we came into office, the graduation rate in Ontario was 68% from high school. It is now 86%. It's an amazing accomplishment. And Sal Rabani, who's sitting right here, this young man who is so successful and doing so well, was a school, a student trustee with the Toronto District School Board, and he was in school at the time when we were fighting really hard to find ways to put, to put back together the publicly funded education system because it had been undermined. So I'm really proud of the fact that we have done that. And we've done it by putting more resources in the schools, by making sure that there are people there to catch kids who are not achieving and figure that out early enough that they can then get their credits and graduate from high school. I am thrilled and proud to say that there are no smog days in Ontario now. You know, it's a huge accomplishment. I mean, there were days when, uh, you know, runners were told not to run, and kids with asthma were told not to go outside, seniors with breathing problems not to go outside. That does not happen. What could be more fundamental than shutting the coal plant so that the air is clean? It's a fundamentally successful uh, endeavor that we have uh, accomplishment. There are 235,000 young people at college and university this year, and they're not paying tuition here, here. because of free tuition that we've put in place. And they're there, they're there, and they wouldn't necessarily otherwise be there. 
Full day kindergarten. When I was a minister of education, we started the rollout of full day kindergarten. And it is a great thing in and of itself for kids. It's a great start. It's also a savings of $6,000 a year for families per child on child care. So it is, it's of, of double benefit to, uh, to families. We've put in place OHIP Plus. Kids now in Ontario from uh, their birth till their 25th birthday get free prescription medication. So we can go through the list. So anyone who says to you, you know, she's afraid of her record, not true. This is our record. We're proud of it. And we're going to continue to build on this foundation as we go forward. So that, the plan that we're putting in place is about building on that foundation. And um, let, me just, uh, let me just talk about the, some of the aspects of that plan. Now, this is a picture of, uh, of me at Kensington Gardens, long-term care home, and all I want to say about this one is that we want to make sure that, to the greatest degree possible, the places where people, when they age, uh, live, when they need to be out of their homes, they are places that are joyful, they are places that are supportive, they are places where people get decent and loving care, and where when you get up in the morning you feel like putting a fascinator on your head. Because really, what could be a happier thing than when you're 90, you want to put a fascinator on? I just think that, is, that says it all. Um, but you know, it's why our plan has got more support for home care, because people want to stay at home. But it's also got more support for long-term care, building more long-term care beds, uh, money for hospitals, making sure that the healthcare system remains strong. It's also about a young woman who uh, I talked to a few couple of months ago now, named Ranisha. She has she's one of those 235,000 young people who is in college. She didn't think that she could uh, go to college. But she's there because of the free tuition that we put in place. She's getting 94% in her program. She wants to work with, uh, with young people. She's a single mom. And there are 13,000 single mothers in that 235,000 number. There are 13,000 single moms who are, uh, who are benefiting from uh, the free tuition plan. And it's, it's a great story. Renisha's is a great story because not only is she there, but she's got a son who's in grade 10, and she's got a toddler. And so her son, we talked about her son, her son is now seeing that post-secondary education is a possibility, that that's, that's where he can go. He's watching his mom go back to school and do it. It's the hard way for sure, but he now sees it as a possibility. So that is, that's again, that's the ripple effect of these decisions that, uh, that we have made. Now, the other part of Renisha's story is that she is, um, she is the mother of a two-year-old. And she actually needs childcare. She needs that support. And so uh, the plan that, part of our plan that puts in place free preschool childcare for kids from two and a half until four, again, builds on the work that we've done by putting full day kindergarten in place, builds on the work that we're doing right now, which is building 100,000 child, new childcare spaces, but recognizes that we have to make those spaces affordable. And it's at two and a half where there's a real bulge of kids whose parents want uh, them in childcare. And so that's why working with the experts, looking at the evidence, that's why we're putting in place by 2020 free preschool childcare for those kids. So Renisha's family kind of demonstrates uh, the needs that, uh, that uh, are, are driving um, some of the major changes that we're proposing as part of our plan. But there's another one, and that is, that is the issues around uh, the healthcare system. And, you know, if we were building, if we were building a healthcare system today, we would include pharmacare and we would include dental care. Um, I grew up in a medical family. My dad's a doctor, a general practitioner, and my grandfather was a general practitioner. So my grandfather started practicing in 1924, and there was no, uh, there was no Medicare, of course, uh, in those years. My father started practicing in 1952, so he spanned both systems. And I can tell you a lot of the stories about their, uh, about their practices were about people's ability to pay. It was a big subject of conversation. And 
And my grandfather used to talk about people bringing baked goods to the house and leaving them on the doorstep for the family because they couldn't pay their bills. And in fact, when I was campaigning in 2003 uh, in Don Valley West, I met a constituent who was an old, she was in her 80s, um, Peg was her name, and uh, she had figured out that I was Charlie Wynn's granddaughter and Charlie Wynn, my grandfather, had, um, had let this woman, Peg, work in the office a bit, and she knew that it was because her family couldn't pay the bill, and she was working off the bill. He didn't ever frame it like that, but she had figured it out as a kid. So, so you know, those are, those are the kinds of stories I grew up with, and even my dad. So practicing starting in 1952, when I was a young kid, um, there were people who'd come in, he knew he wasn't going to get paid, and so when when uh, Medicare came in in the 60s, it was a huge sea change because it meant that people came to the doctor because they knew they could pay and he didn't have to, he didn't have to worry about, uh, and they didn't have to worry about that. So I think that you know, we can agree that our healthcare system is probably the finest expression of our values and how we care for one another, but there are gaps. And so that's why we're moving ahead with Pharmacare in Ontario. Uh, OHIP Plus covers kids from uh, when, they're, when they're kids up until they're 25, and then next year seniors won't have to pay a deductible and won't have to pay any copay. And we know that we need a national Pharmacare plan. And I said that in, uh, in uh, Halifax this weekend to the gathering of Liberals. We want that pressure on, uh, on the national discussion. You know, we were sad to lose Eric Hoskins, but we're glad that he was stolen from us in order to design that, uh, that national Pharmacare plan. But we're not going to wait for that we are going to move ahead because we know that as we did with the enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan, if Ontario puts pressure on the national discussion, then the discussion moves faster because in Ontario we're going to have by next year nearly 50% of the population will be getting free prescription medication. So that's what our plan is about. It's about putting in place the care that people need and these are not these are not made up ideas. These are not ideas that are abstract. These are ideas that are rooted in what people say to us over and over and over again. Families talk to us about whether it's mental health supports, whether it is pharmacare or dental care, whether it is the need to understand how your child's going to find uh, childcare. These are things that, that families talk to us about all the time. What we are facing now is uh, a stark choice. The reality is that that plan that we're putting forward, those, uh, those initiatives that are really about government stepping up when there's uncertainty in people's lives and responding to that uncertainty, um, all of that is at risk. So, you know, what Doug Ford has said is that uh, not that he'll, not that he will take us backwards on climate change, the fight against climate change, he's going to take us out of the game altogether. He's not, he's not going to fight climate change. He's not going to raise the minimum wage. You know, he's, uh, he has said that instead of raising the minimum wage, he will um, cut taxes for uh, people who earn $30,000 or less, or people who are earning minimum wage. Well, the reality is that most people who are earning twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year aren't paying tax. About two-thirds of, of people who are on minimum wage don't pay tax. And so, in fact, people who earn minimum wage will be worse off if they get that tax cut than they would be if the minimum wage were raised to $15 an hour. So, so that kind of... That kind of uh, undermining of what people really need or, or moving away from the anxiety that people are, are facing and not tackling it head on and not being upfront about how you're going to, uh, to deal with it. That's what we're confronting in this election. Um, and you know, it, what, what we are dealing with is a reality that in fact the people who are doing the best the people who are doing really well in terms of large corporations, they're going to benefit from what, uh, what the opposition is putting forward. So that's, that's how stark the choice is. It is really clear the, uh, the difference between what we're proposing. And one of the things that we're dealing with right now is that the, uh, you know, the Conservatives are not 
they are not uh, open to acknowledging how well the economy is doing right now. And you know, I mean, you are leaders in your fields. You know that unemployment is the lowest it's been in 20 years. You, it's a great thing. You know that we're seeing record corporate profits. And you know that uh, we've been leading economic growth in the G7 for three years. So, in fact, Ontario has done really well. It's been hard work to get here. We've made huge investments in infrastructure. We have been working with the private sector to create jobs. And the economy is doing well. But it is, it is, not, it is not as good as it can be. And it is right now that we need to make an investment in people, that we need to make sure that everyone can be at their best. And so when people say to me, well, these are very nice things to have that you're suggesting. You know, it's nice to think about investing in childcare. It's nice to think about um, making sure that people have free prescription medication. It's not that these things are nice to have. These are important to families and, and families make up the economy. Families make up communities. And if families are doing well, if a mom can get back to work because she can find childcare, that's good for that family. Of course it is, but it's good for the economy. If we're going to close the gender wage gap, And I, you know, it's interesting, when, um, when I uh, became Premier in 2013, we actually increased the deficit in order to invest in infrastructure. And that, people understood. People thought, okay, that makes sense. You're investing in infrastructure. That is about, that's about economic growth. But I can tell you, investing in people is about economic growth too. And that's the investment that we are doing right now. So. That choice is extremely stark, and what it comes down to is it comes down to whether we believe as a society that investing in the care that people have said clearly over and over and over again that they need, whether that's the way we want to go, or whether we believe that cutting is going to help. And so when Doug Ford talks about cutting $10 billion out of the services that government provides, and that somehow that will be okay, that somehow everyone can just fend for themselves, and that somehow those are efficiencies. Look, I, I believe that finding efficient ways to do things is important. And sometimes efficiencies save you money, and sometimes they don't. But when, when the Conservatives talk about efficiencies, he's talking about cuts. You cannot cut $10 billion out of the work that the government of Ontario does without affecting education, without affecting health care, and without affecting the services that people in every community across this province need. So that's, that's what we are dealing with. It's, it is what we're dealing with. We're also dealing with, we're also dealing with a, um, another reality, and that is that um, there's, a, there's a real contrast between uh, a plan that it builds on the support that we have built up over years and slogans. And, um, you know, I've said in the last, uh, the last few days that I am going to respond. Um, you know, the, the rhetoric that we've heard uh, south of the border and what we're hearing here in Ontario sounds very similar. And, uh, you know, the Donald Trump, uh, the Donald Trump rhetoric and the Doug Ford rhetoric sound similar because it is similar. Um, and Doug Ford may be Donald Trump, but I'm not Hillary Clinton and I am going to do this differently. So... <laughs> when... When Michelle Obama said, um, and I loved it when she said this, when she said, when they go low, we go high, um, I loved that, except then Donald Trump got elected. So what I'm saying is, when they go low, I'm going to speak up. I am going to call it out, and I am going to name it for what it is. And if it's bullying behavior, that's what I'm going to say. Because we need to be very clear in Ontario. We need to be very clear in Ontario about the kind of society that we want. We have to be clear about the choice that is in front of us. And the people of Ontario will make that choice. And I have the deepest of respect for people across this province. I have been in every corner of Ontario, from the farthest north community of Fort Severn to the 
to Point Pelee, I have been to every corner of this province. People in this province are decent, respectful people, and they want to look after themselves and their families, and they need some help with that. And they will make, uh, they will make the decision that they believe is best. But I am going to fight for the kids who need childcare. I'm going to fight for the seniors who need long-term care and need home care. I'm going to fight for the young moms who want to go to college and don't think they can, but will be able to if they can get free tuition. And I'm going to fight for every one of those communities across this province that is strong because of its people. The community is strong because of the people. The local economy is strong because of people. And the province is strong because of all of those local communities. So that's the fight that we are in. We are in a fight for what we believe is possible here. And I have to tell you, we have the best place in the world to work with. When I, it is the best place. When I, you know, when I travel the world and I have, a, you know, I've been to China and I've been to India and I've been to Vietnam and I've been to places where we take trade missions and we bring Ontario businesses who have so much to offer, but people look at Canada and look at Ontario as a great place to live, as a great place to grow businesses. And so we have all the conditions. We have all the conditions to be the very best society in the world. I think we're already there, but there's always more that we can do. But it is going to mean we have to continue to invest in people. People are our advantage. We're a big geography and a small population, and we need every single person at his or her best. And so that's why I'm going to continue this fight. That's why, that's why our budget looks the way it is. That it does. That's the way, that's why our plan is what it is. It's about meeting people where they are, understanding their concerns, and investing in them so they can be the very best that they can be. So that's, that's our plan, that's the plan we're putting forward, and I am so, so grateful to all of you for being here, and I look forward to your questions. Merci beaucoup. Okay, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I have to agree with you, Ontario is a great place to live. It's a great live. place to <laughs> There's live. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> now, I hope people have thought up some wonderful questions. So we I told mics. the students, the CW Jeffrey kids, has one of you got a question back there? I know that's a terrible thing to do to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> but let me tell you, young people ask the very best questions, particularly high school students. So there we go. Do you see? There you go. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> So as a female leader in, like, in Canada, like, your post is really important. I want to ask you some challenges you faced and you know, how you've overcome them because you're in a really male-dominated world. So I just want to know how you like, went through this process. So the process of getting into a leadership position. So thank you for asking that. And it's true. I am the first female premier in Ontario. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be the last, but we've got a lot of work to do because, you know, we've got, we've got people from all over, from all over the world, we've got people from backgrounds from all over the world, and we don't have the diversity that we need in our legislatures, in our city councils, in leadership positions. So we still got work to do. But let me just say to, uh, to this question, um, you know, I think the most important thing is to gather people around you who are your supporters and can help you. This is, this is not, uh, uh, leadership is not um, a solo role. You know, you have to have a team. You have to have people who believe in you and in whom you believe. I believe in putting Everyone around me, uh, I believe having everyone around me being smarter than I am, you know, so that um, I can get challenged and questioned and we can have really good exchanges. But that's the way, that's the way you move forward, is to have people who support you and then have them bring their supporters on. Um, it's a team. It is about being, uh, being open to advice. And this is the last thing I'll say on this. Um, you have to listen to advice. But at some point, you have to say, thank you very much. I believe I can do this. Because people said to me from the very beginning, when I decided to run for provincial politics, the party didn't 
think that I could win in the riding that I, uh, that I was running in. Um, they said, well, you know, you're, it's not just that you're a woman, you're a lesbian, and I'm not sure you can win in North Toronto. You should move to Riverdale. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> my kids are going to school here. Well, I'm going to move to Riverdale. Anyway, it was just this bizarre moment. Um, so that kind of advice, I said, you know what? I appreciate where you're coming from, but I'm going to take a shot at this. And so I won the nomination, and then I won the riding. And so at every point, you have to, you have, to have that strength inside yourself that you know who to listen to and then who not to listen to so closely. Not that you're disrespectful, but you just say, you know what? That piece of advice, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put in a little box over here because I know what I'm capable of and I'm just gonna take a shot at it. And then you have to be prepared to lose. You have to be prepared to lose. And every single election I've ever gone into, the first election I ran in, 1994 for school trustee, I lost by 72 votes. And Jane and I swore we would never lose an election again <laughs> by that amount. And this one, I'm not losing to Doug Ford by 72 votes. So. Premier Wynne, thank you for your comments. Uh, my question is to ask if you could share with us the uh, comments or discussions within your administration about the risk to the massive increases in, of indebtedness within the province. So um, that is, you know, that is a, um, an issue that has, we have discussed in many different ways. So when I came into office, as I said, in uh, 2013, we were in the process of digging out from the economic downturn, and I made a commitment that we would stay on track to balance the budget by 2017-18. We have done that. Um, we, uh, we, at the time, as I said, when I came into office, we actually increased the deficit a bit in order to invest in infrastructure. Because here's the thing. We knew... Um, starting in 2003 under my predecessor, we knew that there had been decades of neglect in terms of investment in roads and bridges, in transit across the province. Remember when we came into office, the, the transit that had been um, initiated under the, uh, the NDP government was being filled in. The hole had been filled in by the Conservative government on Eglinton Avenue. So there were transit projects that had been stopped and so we were way behind in terms of those investments. So we began investing in 2003. When I came into office in 2013, we actually increased that investment. And so we find ourselves today with um, a balanced budget, about a $600 million surplus, but a real need to invest in people in the ways that I just talked about. And we're paying very close attention to the debt to GDP. You know, sometimes there is, uh, and I know that this is something that um, is talked about a fair bit, um, in, uh, uh, in many different circles, but the comparison of our debt in Ontario to other subnationals, have to remember that we're in a lot of ways not like other subnationals. When I go to the United States, and I've met with 37 governors now, and we talk about NAFTA and we talk about our interconnectedness, I'm very aware of their budgets and the size of their the size of their constituencies, we're way bigger than most of the states in the United States. So our comparisons are not always apples to apples. The other reality is that if you look at our debt, the, there's a, there are two parts to it. One very large part is the long-term debt that we've accrued in order to build that infrastructure. The other part of it, a much uh, different part is the accumulated deficit. And so you have to look at both parts of it, and in that way you'll see how we have, uh, how we have responsibly invested in order to build the economy and build the infrastructure that we need, and at the same time managed our, our deficits. And we will continue to do that. Do we have uh, somebody there? Great. There's one over here, too. Okay. Oh, is there somebody over there? Okay. Hi there. Um, I'd like to talk about sex ed for just a minute. Uh, I, I guess uh, there's so much hysteria around the question of the new sex ed curriculum and, uh, you know, if, if I listened to uh, the new candidate out in the West End, mm -hmm. uh, you would have shown up with horns today, so I, don't, I didn't quite see that. But I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, the rationale for the sex ed curriculum and uh, why it has become so controversial and how to respond to that. Yeah. 
So, um, first of all, it's the health and physical education curriculum. And as Liz Sandals, who is our former Minister of Education, will say, most of it's about you know, how to keep yourself healthy and how to have a, a good diet and how to look after yourself. And a small part of it is the, is the sex ed. Um, and I guess the other, the other thing to remember is that we've had a sex ed curriculum in Ontario. We've had a health and physical education curriculum in Ontario for years. I mean, I was in school, I started school in 1958. And all through my elementary school and high school, there was health and physical education. This is not new. This is an updated curriculum. And so what we're dealing with is um, a curriculum that was updated. It had not been updated since 1998. It was way, way out of date. I mean, there were, there were no smartphones when, uh, when it was uh, last updated. The ki kids didn't have access to the internet. They didn't have access to all of the information that they have access to now, all of the graphic pictures online. And so this is about keeping kids safe. It's about making sure that they get the information that they need when they need it. Um, there, are, there are people who are deeply homophobic, who, who want this to be a, uh, a political issue, when in fact it is about people helping kids to get the information that they need. And I guess, you know, we're going to, we're going to, have, to, uh, we're going to have to have this discussion over and over again. And the, the candidate in Mississauga Center is going to attempt to stir this up. It is very dangerous what she is doing. It is extremely divisive. But the danger part is it is dangerous for kids not to give them the information that they need when they need it. And to assume that kids who are in elementary school are not exposed to graphic information online is to not understand the world. And so that's what the health education system is about. We're going to have one last question. He seems very keen. <laughs> Hamel Bassi from Cambridge. Thank you, uh, Premier, for uh, reminding us of the successes that we've had uh, up to, to now. But through your crystal ball, um, I know <laughs> oh, you're going to get elected. I crystal ball. <laughs> Four years from now, what do you see as an even great, greater success for Ontario? Oh, I think that there are... Um there are so many things that we're working on that will come to fruition over the, over the next four years. When you stand up, Pramail, one of the things that I see immediately is the, is the high-speed rail to uh, southwestern Ontario, you know, to Kitchener-Waterloo and through to London. Um, you know, we will, be, we will be well on our way. We're doing the preliminary work, uh, preliminary work for that. We will see full day, can, full, sorry, free preschool childcare in place in, uh, at the end of those uh, four years. And I hope, I hope that with the cooperation and the support of the federal government, we would have a national pharmacare plan in place. That would be one of my hopes for four years from now. So I think there are great, great things that, uh, that we have to look forward to, but we've got to make We've got to make investments now in order for those things to come to fruition. Let me just end on this. One of the things that um, the leader of the opposition has said recently, and it speaks to this long-term thinking, he, uh, when we brought out our plan and we talked about uh, putting in place full, I keep saying full-day kindergarten, I don't mean that, I mean free preschool childcare, he said that he was, he was denigrating the idea by saying that we were talking about an idea, an investment, for unborn children, and how ridiculous was that, that we were talking about uh, free preschool uh, childcare for kids who hadn't even been born yet. And I would just say to you, what on earth is the role of government if not to plan, yes, for today, but to plan for unborn children? How could we possibly think that that's not our role? So. I'm here for you guys, but I'm here for the unborn children, too. <laughs> Premier you. Wynne, on behalf of all of us here, the Canadian Club of Toronto, we want to thank you for sharing your thank ideas. You. Certainly, your resolve and your passion and your commitment to this province are very high. 
Um, and, and we've seen this through a lot of the programs that you've put into place and things that you've done for us here. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your energy. Thank Apologies you. for uh, the friends that came. <laughs> it's democracy. It's democracy, and it's alive Jillian. and well. Yeah. You're right. Your, your plans to continue, and that's a great point. It is a democracy. It's democracy. Yeah. And your plans to continue to build Ontario are ambitious, they're exciting, and you've hit on many, many key issues that resonate, whether it's income, retirement security, the health, the well-being of all Ontario's, Ontarians, and creating good and well-paying jobs and pay equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Please Thanks, accept Jillian. our best wishes for your campaign. Before we conclude, before we conclude, I would like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's event. To learn more about the club, please visit us at CanadianClub.org. I'd like to once again acknowledge the generosity of today's event sponsors, the Insurance Bureau of Canada and Morneau Chappelle, without whom these events would not be possible. Thank you for attending, and we hope to see you all again soon. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.